In chapter eight, we're going to combine ideas from chapter six and seven and talk about the fact that Lewis structures aren't always great at predicting properties of molecules. They're good at you know, predicting the shape. Sometimes we did that with the end of chapter seven with valence shell electron pair repulsion to look at electron pair geometries and molecular geometries. And that's fine for the shape, okay? but it also doesn't tell us things about how bonds form, for example. Another idea we will talk about in chapter eight. One other thing we're going to focus on, a question we will answer by the end of the chapter, is thinking about the Lewis structures of oxygen, right, which has a double bond, diatomic oxygen, okay? and then three lone pairs or sorry, two lone pairs on each side. Get rid of two of those. And looking at nitrogen, at diatomic nitrogen, which has a triple bond between and one lone pair on each nitrogen. If we look at these two structures, right, all the electrons appear to be paired up, right? Lone pair, lone pair, bonds, lone pairs on the other oxygen, lone pair, lone pair, triple bond. Uh, and you'll probably want to Google the Lewis structures for O2 and N2 to get a clearer picture than those terrible drawings. But when you do that, you'll see that all the electrons appear to be paired up. Okay? But by the end of this chapter, we're going to learn about paramagnetism and diamagnetism, which tells us that, in fact, in oxygen, some of the electrons are unpaired, right? which Lewis structures and Lewis valence bond theory don't really give me information about. Okay? Why does oxygen respond to a magnetic field while nitrogen doesn't? So that's something to keep in your mind as we go through chapter eight. So what does the format for this chapter look like, the, the outline? Okay? In this first shorter video, we're going to talk about valence bond theory. Okay. Then in the second video, third and fourth, we'll talk about hybrid orbitals, multiple bonds, so double bonds and triple bonds, and then lastly, molecular orbital theory. Okay. But like I mentioned, we're combining ideas from six and seven. So what information do we need to bring forward with us? Okay. This is what we saw in chapter six, shapes of our orbitals. In chapter eight here, we're really going to be concerned with S and P, okay. and to a lesser extent, D. So know that the S orbital is spherical. Right? And these p orbitals are dumbbell shaped. There are three of them, right? Degenerate energies that point different ways along the x, y, and z axis. So how do we tie this into Lewis structures and bonding those shapes? Yeah. Well, previously we were just looking at an understand a basic understanding of a covalent bond. Yeah. It's sharing a pair of electrons. In the 30s, Linus Pauling helped develop what's known as the valence bond theory of covalent bonding. That same Linus Pauling that gave us the electronegativity from chapter 7. Okay. In valence bond or VB theory, which we've talked about before, it tells us that electrons reside in orbitals. Okay. We should know that from chapter 6. Okay. Covalent bonds form when electrons are shared. We've talked about that pretty much the whole semester. And the only other tricky thing is that electrons in those overlapping orbitals have to have opposite spins. Okay? So thinking about that last quantum number from chapter six, m sub s, one has to be plus one half, the other one has to be minus one half. Okay? But basically the big takeaway right here, orbitals have to overlap to form a bond. Okay? Why does that form a bond? Okay, Because when I share those electrons, which are negatively charged, I put them between two nuclei, which are positively charged. They're attracted to both nuclei. The electrons are attracted to both nuclei simultaneously. That helps form our bond. And that bond is established at a certain distance right, where we have the lowest possible energy, which is controlled by our orbital overlap. Brings us to another figure that we saw in chapter six as well. Yeah, We bring our energy lower, right? thinking about the potential energy here, then having the two nuclei exist just on their own right, by establishing that orbital overlap where I've minimized the potential energy. Okay? 
that happens at a certain bond distance, here 0.74 angstroms, and gives us a lowering in energy, known as the bond energy, okay, of 436 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So that's why our bond's established, right? To get lower in energy. Other information that we need to bring forward from chapter six, right? Still just previous knowledge, which we can get from this table as bonds get higher in order, okay? So as we go from single to double to triple, bonds get stronger, of course, right? And they also get shorter. So let's use all of that information to discuss a little bit more about balanced bond theory. The VB theory says that in order to form a covalent bond, I have to have at least one unpaired electron to contribute to the bond. Because remember, in a covalent bond, thinking about a single bond, both of the atoms that are involved in the bond contribute one electron, okay? That gives us a pair of two electrons in a single bond. So the maximum number of bonds that I can form to an atom is determined by the number of unpaired electrons that that atom has after you draw the Lewis symbol. So if you draw the Lewis symbol for nitrogen, for example, with five valence electrons, that Lewis symbol would have three unpaired electrons and one lone pair. Okay, so three unpaired electrons, nitrogen likes to form three bonds. And valence bond theory is good for explaining bonding in diatomic molecules and single bonds. It does have some drawbacks with higher order bonds. It also is a good explanation of why noble gases don't bond. Because if you draw the Lewis symbol for any noble gas, do you know neon or krypton or argon, they have eight valence electrons. So when you draw the Lewis symbol, everybody has a partner. They're all paired up, so they don't bond. But the biggest takeaway in terms of new information from chapter eight from this first video is how orbitals overlap to form bonds. And this is where the information from six, seven, and eight are coming together. Because the orientation of our orbitals is important as well. When we're forming a bond, we want a nice direct line between those two nuclei. Okay, that gives us the maximum possible overlap. Otherwise, if they came at one another at an angle, it would be at higher energy. And that's not as important here for the S's when they're spherical, okay, but it is for the P's down here. Okay? Think about it like a handshake. Okay? If you're going to shake someone's hand, you go directly at the hand. Right? You don't shake hands like this. That's weird. Okay? So an angle would be higher energy. Our orbitals have to overlap straight on with one another. And what's shown on this slide is three different ways to form what's known as a sigma bond, which is kind of in an oversimplification. You can think about that as a new word for a single bond. The definition of a sigma bond is a covalent bond where the electron density is along the internuclear axis, meaning it's directly between the two nuclei. And we can do that three different ways, overlapping an S and an S, overlapping an S and a P, or overlapping two P orbitals, only if they're going end to end. So they have to go straight at one another. That's the only way to form a sigma bond, which is what we're seeing at the bottom of this slide. Right? They have to approach one another head on. Those are three ways to form a sigma bond. We also have a pi bond. Okay. Pi bonds, definition of that, are covalent bonds where the electron density is on opposite sides of the internuclear axis. So there's no electron density actually along the axis between the two nuclei because that space has already been taken up. You can't form a pi bond until you already formed a sigma bond. And the sigma, sigma bond takes up the space that's between the nuclei, right? The sigma bond would be taking up the space in here. So the pi bond goes outside of that. Pi bonds are above and below the internuclear axis. And there's only one way to form a pi bond, and that's by taking two p orbitals together. But now instead of going end to end, they're going together side to side. And you see they then overlap on the top and on the bottom, those two lobes. Okay. So we definitely need to know sigma and pi bonds okay, and how they correspond to the bonding we see in structures. Single bonds are always sigma bonds. No exceptions there. 
Okay, we're going to learn in the next video another way to form a sigma bond. But anytime you see a single bond, it's a sigma bond. Okay. Higher order bonds have both sigma and pi bonds. Okay. We always start with a sigma, but then to get the second part of a double bond, that's a pi bond. So it's one sigma and one pi. A triple bond is one sigma bond, and then it needs two more bonds, and both of those are pi bonds. One that's above and below the internuclear axis, and another one that's in front and behind, thinking about this in 3D. Okay. So the first bond that's formed is always sigma, and then if you have a double bond, it's one pi, and a triple bond is two pi. There's a lot of old review information in this video, okay, but the key takeaway in terms of new information is right here in this slide. Know what a sigma bond is, know what a pi bond is, and how they relate to single, double, and triple bonds. In this video, all we've been thinking about is two atoms coming together. The next question we're gonna answer in video two is how do bonds form between more than two atoms with a lot of the Lewis structures that we've seen in the past.